Good morning, Athens. How you guys doing? Hey, you look great. Good to see you. Hey, I want to start off by telling you a story about a friend of a friend named Dave. Okay? Dave is a frequent business traveler. This is in a time before COVID when people hopped on a plane all the time. And Dave was on a trip in Atlantic City, New Jersey. He had a business meeting there that day, and after his meeting, he had some time to kill before he needed to catch his flight and get back home. So Dave wrapped up his meeting, went back to the hotel. He opened up his laptop in front of him, and he was knocking out some work. And about the time Dave was going to head over to the airport, a really attractive lady walked up and asked Dave if he wanted to get a drink. Dave was surprised, but he was flattered, so he said, okay. Now, Dave is single, so this is all right. Um, Dave told her what he wanted. She went up to the bar. She grabbed the drink. She came back. They sat down. They said cheers and clinked their glasses together. Dave took a sip, and that was the last thing he remembered. At least it was the last thing he remembered until he woke up in a bathtub full of ice. And he started to freak out. He saw the note on the vanity beside him. It said, don't move, call 911. Dave picked up his phone. His fingers were numb and clumsy from the ice, but frantically he dialed 911, and he was trying to explain to the 911 operator what was going on, and she seemed oddly familiar with the situation. And she said, sir, uh, don't freak out, but will you slowly and carefully reach around and see if there is a tube coming from your back? And he did, and sure enough, there was. And the 911 operator said, Sir, there are a ring of organ thieves going around the city. They're harvesting kidneys. They've gotten to yours. Don't move. The paramedics are on their way. It's a crazy story, isn't it? Craziest part is it's not even true. But it's a good story, right? You guys are locked in, first thing. What I just told you is one of the most successful urban legends of the last 20 years. It's actually the opening story of one of my favorite business books called Made to Stick by Chip and Dan Heath. What's an urban legend? Something that's not true but told over and over. Think about this. If we walked out of here right now into the hall of the Classic Center, you may not remember his name was Dave. You might not remember his Atlantic City, but you could tell most of that story. You would talk about something being slipped in his drink and a bathtub full of ice and his kidney being stolen. And what they learned and they unpacked in that book, Made to Stick, is that there is a process for stories that make them memorable and repeatable. And in the same way that there's a process for stories that make them memorable and repeatable, there is a process that makes businesses work. It's not like some people just happen to get it and they're just effective and others aren't. But there's a process, and that's what today is all about. It's breakout speakers. It's amazing sessions. It's Dana Spinola and Jesse Itzler and Chad Brown and people that are going to unpack business principles that lead to proven success. And so I don't know if you got a pen and paper. Maybe you just got your, your phone out to take some notes. I know you'll have the opportunity to go back and see this in the app. But I want to talk today to set the stage for the most pivotal business principle that has changed our company. And it's not something that's elusive, it's not something that most people can't grasp, it's something that I believe every business owner can get, but it starts with having the right perspective. So uh, as we think about this concept of perspective, I want you to go back, I'm gonna go back to this one real quick. How many of you have been to the eye doctor recently? Anybody been to the eye doctor recently? Okay, Do you, who likes going to the eye doctor? Anybody? So some people like that. It's not like the dentist. A lot of people like going and hanging out there and seeing what, you know, they they like to go see. I hate the part where they put your chin on the thing and they blow, you know, they do the thing in your eye where to check, make sure you're, you're all good there. The last time I went to the eye doctor, he put my chin on the deal. He put these giant lenses in front of me and he put an eye chart up that looked something like this. You guys know what I'm talking about? And then he said this. He says, is it better or worse? Is it better or worse? Better or worse? The last time he did it, he said, Kevin, is it worse or worser? And I said, worser. And he said, that's not a word. And I'm like, well, you gave me the option. So, uh, but here's the thing that was amazing to me. When you're looking at the chart, the chart on the wall never changes. But the lens with which you look through changes, so it causes you to see it differently. Think about that. The chart hasn't changed, but your perspective changes. 
Okay, how many of you have seen this before? You guys seen this? All right, just real quick, we'll clear it up. How many of you see the older lady raise your hand? Okay, see the older lady? Hands down. How many of you see the younger lady raise your hand? Okay, more younger ladies, less older lady. Anybody, be honest in here, anybody not see both of them? Anybody not see both? There's a couple, okay, we'll do extra credit at the end. Just hang out on one of the breaks and I'll help you see it. But it's interesting, we're all looking at the same thing, but we're seeing something different. All right, remember this Facebook phenomenon from a few years ago, big controversy? We can settle it once and for all. What color is the dress? How many of you see black and blue? Raise your hand. Hands down. How many of you see white and gold? Raise your hand. Isn't this crazy? We're sitting in the same room, in the same town, at the same conference. We're looking at the exact same screen, yet we're seeing something different. I want you to think about this idea of perspective because perspective is how we view things and the way we view things changes how we do things. That's why, I want you to think about this because a lot of people would tell you, why do you waste your time going to a business conference? Because the reality is you're gonna walk out of here today, you're gonna go back into your business tomorrow and most of you will have the same problems you had today, you'll have the same people you had today, you'll have the same P&L you had today, Nothing will have changed from today until tomorrow except your perspective. And if you can change your perspective, you really can change your life. I got to be a student at the University of Georgia, and my perspective was changed 15 plus years ago when I was here on this campus at this amazing place. That's that's exciting. That That is worth cheering for. I, sh- I showed up to UGA, and if any of you went to a large school, whether it's UGA, it's uh, Georgia Southern, North Georgia, Auburn, it, I mean, I don't like other SEC schools, but there's something similar about all of these large universities, and it's that when you show up, there's a million and one things you can get involved with on campus. You guys know what I'm talking about? There's some, whatever religion you are, whatever political persuasion you have, whatever obscure sport you like to play, there's some group somewhere that's playing it that you can sign up for. And when I showed up here, I had a friend and he said, hey, Kevin, you need to get involved with this charity that helps kids with HIV and AIDS. And I was like, nah, I don't, I don't really know a lot about that. It's not something that, that I am personally passionate about. So maybe I should just do something that's more, like something I've had experience with. Maybe uh, something that helps kids with special needs or people affected by cancer. Something that I could relate to. But my friend was a really good salesperson. You guys know people like that? They can talk you into things. And he said, hey, there's two reasons you really need to get involved with this charity. Number one, the football coaches are involved. At that time it was Mark Richt, Coach Dooley was involved. I grew up believing that if you were good when you died, you went to Vince Dooley's house. So that was like, that was something I thought this is worth doing. So that was pretty persuasive. And the organization I was with did two things, mentoring programs and one day special events. And my favorite event we ever did was in 2006, we turned that stadium into a giant movie theater. We called it Film on the 50. It was after a G-Day game, and we brought kids from across the state to watch the movie called The Incredibles on the Jumbotron. Any Incredibles fans out here? I love that movie. We thought the kids were going to be pumped. They were in Sanford Stadium, on the field, between the hedges, 92,000 person stadium, and here's what we learned. Most of them didn't give a rip about the stadium. Sorry to all of us UGA fans. Most of them didn't care anything about the movie. They were excited to have a college student to hang out with for the day, somebody to call a friend. The little girl I worked with that day, she was six years old, and she was most passionate about free Chick-fil-A that was coming at the end of the movie. What you guys are having for lunch today, that's what she was most excited about. And she talked about it the whole time, and I'm super competitive. Most of you probably show up at a business summit, you're probably pretty competitive. So when the food got there, we rushed over, we were the first one in line got her the Chick-fil-A sandwich, came back, sat down on the big G, the 50-yard line, cut the sandwich in half, and she inhaled the first half of it like you've never seen somebody eat a Chick-fil-A sandwich. But then she did something that was surprising. She took the other half and she wrapped it back up. And I was like, this is what you've talked about all day. Don't you want to finish the rest of the sandwich? More than 14 years ago, and I remember it like it was yesterday. I'll never forget what she said. 
She said, I really do want to eat it, but I want to save it for my grandmother at home who never gets to have Chick-fil-A either. 50% of the kids there that day had lost a parent. This little girl lost both. What does a story about a little girl focused on her grandmother have to do with business? It has to do with perspective. Because that moment changed my perspective. No knock to UGA professors, but I learned a heck of a lot more about leadership from a six-year-old girl than I ever learned in a classroom. Because what she understood is that real leadership is servant leadership. And servant leadership is how do you take the resources you have and leverage them to help other people. And I believe that works in business. But that perspective changed my life. You may hear something today, you may meet someone today, you may learn something today that will trigger a new perspective that will change your life. Remember what we said, the way we view things changes how we do things. Perspective is the only thing in the world that can radically transform the results we get without altering a single element of our environment. Think about that. You go back to work tomorrow, nothing in your environment has changed, but if your perspective changes, it changes your life. I like this next principle right here. Uh, a change in perspective leads to a change in action, which equals a change in results. Change in perspective, how we view things, changes how we do things. That's a natural thing. And when you change how you do things, it changes the results you get. We'll never have a stronger business until we have a clearer perspective. And today is about shifting your perspective. I'm going to give you four areas. If you've got a pen, paper, you're taking notes, there's four areas I want to talk about walking out of here with a clearer perspective. You may not need all four. You may just need one of the four. But if we can walk out with a fresh perspective in one of these areas, it can transform our companies and our results that we're getting. So number one, changing our perspective on purpose. Changing our perspective on purpose. How many of you in your business, you have a mission statement or a vision statement? How many of you have one of those? Raise your hand. How many of you, either you or other people that work around you, could recite that, could know it? Raise your hand. Okay, we went down a little bit. The next question is, of the ones who could recite it and know it, how many of them, it guides what they do? There's a few in here. So often when we work with businesses, we work with like a financial institution, a bank, a lot of times they'll say, well, Kevin, the purpose stuff, that's the fluffy stuff. That's not the stuff that actually affects the bottom line. That's not the stuff that actually matters. But one of the things that we have found over and over in businesses is it, it, you will never motivate other people until you have a clearly identified purpose. And it works even when it's not fun. See, I spend a lot of the time that we get to spend with businesses are business owners that have hired us because they're really mad about trying to hire millennials who they're frustrated with. Anybody? Any of you who are a millennial and you also feel that way sometimes? Sometimes they show up, my age group too, show up and say, hey, I like the job description. I really like to do this thing, this thing, this thing. Not really interested in doing that part of it. And what happens is so many people without a clear purpose and a tie to the purpose aren't willing to do the stuff that just flat out sucks sometimes. Let me show you how having a clearer purpose will do that. Everybody, I need everybody to participate right in here. How many of you in this room, you graduated from college? I want you to raise your hand. How many of you graduated from college? Raise your hand. Most of the room, at least most of them that participated. All right, two more questions on it. How many of you that graduated from college took a class while you were in college that you thought was stupid. Raise your hand. I think more people took a class that was stupid than graduated. So that may tell us something. Okay. So glad you thought it was stupid. Last one. How many of you passed the class that you thought was stupid? Almost universal. Why'd you pass it? Had to? Why? Why'd you pass it? Why'd you pass the class? GPA, you needed it for a good GPA. Why'd you guys pass it? Requirement to graduate. See, in each situation, you had a clear goal. The goal is graduation. The goal is a high GPA. The goal is so I don't lose a scholarship. The goal is so my parents don't kill me. 
And when you have a clear goal, you were willing to do something that you admitted was stupid. And you did it anyway, and you did it well because you had a clear goal. This principle is really key, that when the purpose is clear, the mundane becomes meaningful. When the purpose is clear, the mundane becomes meaningful. Now, this word meaningful is very, very important. I want you to write it down. I want you to circle it. I want you to remember it. When the goal is clear, the goal is graduation, the goal is a high GPA, the goal is the scholarship, the goal is my parents won't kill me. When the goal is clear, that activity that was stupid became meaningful. Never said it became fun. You don't wake up and say, oh, now that the goal's clear, oh, yeah, this is fun, this is really exciting. No, but when it's clear, the mundane becomes meaningful. The best leaders, the best businesses, the best organizations have a clearly defined purpose, a clearly defined goal, and then they help tie your activities to that goal. When you walk in a restaurant, somebody has to clean that bathroom. And that's probably not the most fun job in the world, but you know what? If you want to create a remarkable customer experience, having a clean bathroom is part of it. And if you can help tie mundane activities to meaningful outcomes, you increase engagement, and you make sure that you get those jobs done. This is one of the key pieces to engaging any age and having strong corporate culture. So number one, You've got to change your perspective on purpose. Purpose isn't some fluffy thing. It's not some statement you put on the wall. It's not the thing just in the handbook. But when it's clear and you tie activities to it, when the purpose is clear, the mundane becomes meaningful. Purpose helps us drive towards something that we need to do. Purpose alone is not enough. Because I actually find that 20 years ago, we had a lot of businesses that lacked purpose, and as the next generation came up, and they weren't as focused on profit and growth, they were focused on finding purpose and, and growth personally, that so many businesses had to make a shift to say, it, we can't just be about the bottom line, we have to have a strong bottom line, but we have to be purposeful in some way. We thought that was enough, but now we have a lot of businesses who are purpose-driven, who have terrible focus. And so that's when we have to think about this concept of priority. And I use the word priority purposefully in a singular way. A couple of years ago, our business was starting to grow. It was starting to thrive, and I felt like I was running in a million different directions. Anybody relate to that? And I had a friend hand me the book Essentialism by Greg McEwen is an author from the UK. There's an opening part of that book that changed the trajectory of our business for me when he said this principle right here, very beginning of his book. He says, the word priority came into the English language in the 1400s, and it was singular. Priority was singular. It meant the very first or prior thing. Priority, singular. I love that. It stayed singular for the next 500 years. Look at this. Only in the 1900s did we pluralize the term and start talking about priorities. I like that next word right there. Illogically, we reasoned that by changing the word, we could bend reality. I remember sitting in a meeting with some of our team members. Our youngest team member at the time was 23. She was an Auburn grad. I won't hold that too much against her. I told her, here's the three priorities we have over the next quarter. These are the three most important things we need to do. I finished the meeting in front of the rest of the team. She raised her hand and she said this, yes, but Kevin, which one is the most important? She wasn't being a smart aleck. She was genuinely curious. When these two come in conflict with each other, which one should we choose? If I'm running, a, a, I'll go back to a restaurant. If I'm running a restaurant, I need it to be quick, but I also need it to be safe. Guess what we spend more time when it's not COVID talking about? Speed. We got to do it faster, we got to do it faster, we got to do it faster. But when speed and safety come into conflict, which one's more important? You see, for us, we've got to be able to prioritize our priorities. This has been a revelation for me personally. How many of you are to-do list people? You get up in the morning, you make a to-do list of all the things you want to get done that day. That is 100% me, and I get such satisfaction of crossing things off the list. Anybody else? 
Sometimes, this is embarrassing, but sometimes I write down really easy things on the list so I get the sense of satisfaction of crossing them off. Like, put on my clothes. Yep, it's going to be a good day. Really embarrassing? Sometimes, I mean, this is so stupid, it makes no logical sense, but there are times at the end of the day where I didn't do a lot of the things on my list, so I'd go back and write down the things I did so that I could cross them off. Anybody do this? I've migrated a little bit now. A lot of times I use my phone. I go to the notes app. I make a list of things. I got 12, 13 things I need to get done today. I do 10 or 11 of them. I feel pretty good about myself. But the thing I need to do on Monday gets moved to Tuesday. And then the next day it gets moved to the next day. And then it gets moved to the next day. We will never be truly effective until we prioritize our priorities. And I love this principle right here. Purpose shows us when to say yes but priority reveals when to say no. I have met far too many entrepreneurial business people that are really smart, they do really good things, but the truth is that they start chasing a lot of things they never should have chased. And they start adding, 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 and all of a sudden their focus has gotten distracted and their business is less effective than it should be. So purpose shows us when to say yes. Priority reveals when to say no. So you've got to change your, your perspective on purpose. Purpose isn't a mission statement. It's not just elusive. It's something you live by. Priority is not plural. You've got to prioritize your priorities. I want to talk about this one for a minute, changing your perspective on people. And I want you to look through this through your lens of you personally and the people you work with. All right. I want you to see this graph right up here. Not me. I want you to see... This is more, a lot more important than me. I call this chart the high cost of low engagement. The high cost of low engagement. If you can take a picture of it, I'll send it out to you in a minute. But every single one of us in this room, at some point, when you lose your mic, there we go. Every single one of us has been somewhere on this chart in our lives. We all enter our, our work, whatever our newest job is, in quadrant number one, bottom right. We show up and we're passionate, but we're not prepared. If you don't like the word passionate, it feels too fluffy for you, use the word engaged, but not equipped. How many of you remember your first day at whatever job you're at now, the first day starting your business? You remember that? You show, it, if you weren't excited the first day, we got a problem. Most people, they show up, they're excited about it, they're passionate but they're not yet prepared. There we go. Passionate, but not prepared. Then what happens, can we leave this one up for just a little bit? We go through training. We start to develop. We start to grow. And then we move as we're trained, as we're engaged, to quadrant number two. We're then passionate and prepared. We know what to do, and we're excited about doing it. This is where we want every single person and every single business to live, is in quadrant number two. But the truth is, at some point in each of our lives, even if we started the business and we own it, we end up moving to places like quadrant number three. Quadrant number three is where you're prepared. You know how to do the job, but you're no longer passionate about it. How many of you be honest enough to say that at some point, maybe even in this year, you've been in that boat? You know how to do the work, but you're not that excited about it. And then if we stay in quadrant number three long enough, we'll end up going down into quadrant number four. We've been not passionate for so long that now we're not even good at our job anymore. We're not prepared. Now, how many of you, what's your business right here? Real estate. All right. Real estate. How long have you been in it? 15 years. So you get to, do you work for yourself? Spend a lot of time. You probably most of the time are living in number two. Maybe, sometimes number three. What's interesting when we think about that is if you live a lot of time in number two, you would by far be the exception for the American workforce. Gallup's study, where they surveyed 1.7 million people across 60,000 businesses or divisions within a business, do you know what they found how many people in the workforce are not engaged? What's your guess? What percentage? 20, 30, 40. That's what a lot of people say about their business. Gallup would say that 61% of the 
are in what they call quadrant number three. They, uh, they, would, they would use it a different term. They'd say people are disengaged, 61%. But it gets worse. They would say that another 16% are in quadrant four. They're actively disengaged. Like, they don't just not like work. They show up every day trying to figure out how to bring the deal down. Anybody got people like that in your company? Like, they're not just not happy. They're actively not happy and trying to destroy. And I'll tell you, people in quadrant three and quadrant four, they talk a lot more. Quadrant two, you don't talk in quadrant number two. You don't sit up there and say, have we talked lately about just how much we love our work? We talked about how fun it is. But in quadrant three, you talk. God, can you believe this? Even among other people, other real estate agents, God, can you believe the crap we got to deal with now? And we recruit people into quadrant number three. I want to give you an example. Let's just do some quick math with the business. I was talking to Josh Melton. He said the cleaning, uh, Athens Cleaning Company, they've got 10 full-time employees and 30 part-time employees. Let's just do a little bit of math. I'm going to pick on Josh for a second. Let's take the 30 part-time employees. You got a calculator? Somebody have one with me? Who's got it? Right here? Where are you at? 30 part-time employees. He said, I don't know what is wrong with this. Sorry, you all. All right, can I get a hand help? Uh, 30 part-time employees. They make, on average, $15 an hour. So 30 times 15. Actually, let's go with their percentages. Let's say that 50% of them, thank you so much. Let's say that 50% of them are, are disengaged. So let's go 15 employees at $15 an hour. Let's say that those 15 employees at $15 an hour work on average 20 hours a week. What's our number now? 4,500. Let's say they work on average 50 weeks a year. Get a couple weeks off. What's our number now? 225,000. So if we're at a lower number than Gallup, and we just say 50% of them are, are not engaged. They're making $15 an hour, 20 hours a week at 50 weeks a year. Now, let's say they're not totally unproductive. It's not that they're not productive at all. They're just less productive. Let's say they're 20% less productive because they're disengaged. Do that number times 0.2. $4,000 an hour. See, there's actually a real cost to people being less engaged. There's a real cost to you being less engaged. If your productivity is down, so the people side is important. Now, this is a big, big thing because I deal with too many people that have decided that they only have hired morons and they'll never be able to change course. I seriously, I spoke to the Georgia Grocers Group last summer. I had a guy that sat on the front row. He had his arms crossed the whole time. He said, son, I got pairs of underwear older than you. Um, he was not that excited to be there. And I was talking about different hiring strategies. We're talking about companies like Chick-fil-A and how they attract top talent. And he said, oh, he said, if I can just find somebody that can tie their shoes and put a sentence together, I'll hire them. And we kind of laughed like some of you are doing because it was funny. But what does that say to the people that he's hired? See, it's really important that you pour into people in a different way. This doesn't matter if you're the owner, if you're a manager, if you're not a people leader, but you're in an organization. Seeing people differently is important. I had a conversation with a police officer in inner city Atlanta. He, he is in the 30314 zip code. It's the area around Mercedes-Benz Stadium. It's one of the highest crime highest poverty areas in the state of Georgia, and I made a statement to him. I said, man, I bet sometimes you deal with some rough folks. And I immediately regretted what I said because he turned around and he said, no, most of the time I just deal with good people on their worst days. Most of the time I deal with good people on their worst days. He understood this principle is the way you see people is the way you treat them. The way you see people is the way you treat them. If you want to move employees from quadrant three to quadrant two, if you want to have people more engaged at work, you've got to start seeing them differently and treating them differently. And this is not some Pollyanna. I'm telling you, if, if they're not good for long enough, you've got to get rid of them. But have you tried moving people and seeing them differently? Remember, if you see them differently, 
you'll do things differently. I can't tell you how many people on my team I've said, oh, well, she's always going to be negative. He's always going to be a pain. It's always, and I've put them in a box and put a label on it, and as long as I have them in a box with a label, they'll never be able to get out of it. So for some of us, you need to be thinking about somebody in your organization now. Some, maybe it's not even an internal person. Maybe it's a client that if you'll see them differently, you'll treat them differently, and you'll get unbelievably different results. Changing our perspective on people, changing our perspective on purpose, changing our perspective on priority. I want to give you one more. I want to talk about this idea of progress. How many of you, I missed when Josh or Chad asked the questions, how many of you in here own your own business? Raise your hand. A lot of you. How many of you are in a position in a business where you have influence over either a, some people or some process. You have some leadership responsibility in your business. Raise your hand. So many people in this room. And I want you to think about this. We are in a year where it feels like everything is changing. I had a conversation with a CEO of a fairly large bank, and I told him, I said, Man, we, we're just in a time where things are moving very quickly. They're changing. We're having to adapt what we do. And he said, yeah, I'm sick and tired in my business because everybody's always talking about change. And he said it's the wrong word because he said we need to remember. We, he said instead of change, we should be talking about progress because he said all progress is change, but not all change is progress. All progress has changed, but not all change is progress. And he said, so what we need to do is we need to audit the change, and we need to make sure it's good. But it's not just that the change is good. It's actually more than that. I want you to get this. You've got to catch this part. Do you know even when we're having progress, a lot of times that leads to negative side effects for every single one of us? Even when things are going well, even when it's exactly what we had hoped it would be, we wanted the, the promotion, we wanted the position, we wanted the business to grow, and all of the sudden, the thing we had hoped for, the thing we had dreamed about, the thing that we had built everything towards, ends up not being a dream, but it ends up being a nightmare for us. I love reading leadership books. You're going to have Jesse Itzler at the end of the day, he's written an incredible book. So many great books out there. I remember asking a friend, I said, hey, I'm looking for a new leadership book to read. What would you recommend that I read? And uh, nobody get uncomfortable in here with this part. He said, hey, I just tell you. He said, I've read a lot of them. He said, I'd go, go to the, uh, the Bible and take the book of Proverbs, and whatever day of the month it is, just read that chapter. Try that and see what it's like. All right, I'm not taking up an offering. I'm not going to preach. You guys don't worry. But I did it. I did it for a couple months. If it was... You know, today is 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, I'm going to read the 8th chapter. And I'll be honest with you, some of it was really good, and some of it made no sense to me. I mean, some of it was like, hey, where there is no vision, the people perish. I come back, I can tweet that, I can tell my business, if we don't have vision, we're going to die. Like, this is so important. I loved it. But some of it was like, this doesn't make any sense. And one of those was this proverb, it's Proverbs 14.4, and it says, where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but from the strength of the ox comes the increase of the harvest. I want you to see that. Get it up here on the screen. Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but with the strength of the ox comes the increase of the harvest. All right, how many of you are from a suburban area or an urban area? Raise your hand. Okay, a lot of people. How many of you from a more rural area? Okay, so I grew up in Cobb County, Georgia, this did not mean a whole lot to me. But my wife is from McRae, Georgia, in Telfair County. She was in the FFA in high school. She still has the jacket to prove it. She had a job when she was in school. One of her roles in the FFA was to show pigs. I didn't know that was a job you could have, but that was one of her, her gigs. So that thing didn't mean anything to me until I went and I spent time with her family on this farm. Not her farm, but somebody in their area. And it was interesting to hear because when I got there, this started to make sense to me. You see, this proverb, it, it's not a religious thing. I'll just I want you to think about it. It's painting a picture of two farms. Okay, on the first farm, it says this. There are no oxen, so the manger or the barn or the stable is clean. Let me give a translation for those of you who didn't grow up or are not very familiar with a farm. 
on this farm there are no animals, and because there are no animals, there's no crap that's got to be cleaned up. That's what it says. There are no animals, so the manger is clean. But then it paints a picture of this other farm way over here on this side, and it says, but at this farm, with the strength of the ox comes the increase of the harvest. On this farm, there are animals, which, and because there are animals, there's growth that's happening. There's progress that's happening. There's things that we're supposed to be doing. So on this farm, there are animals, and there's a harvest. What it does not say, but it implies, is on this farm, somebody's got to grab a shovel because there's some crap that's got to be cleaned up. This farm, no animals, no crap, but also no harvest. This farm over here, animals, growth, progress, but there's some crap that people have to deal with. On the surface, this farm sounds pretty good, except that farm isn't doing what that farm was created to do. I remember starting our business. Every bit of it was challenging, trying to figure out how to get enough money, how we were going to make the end of the month happen, if, if we should throw in the towel, if we should just do something different the next year. There were seasons where I never thought we'd make it. But the, th the activities we had to do, I got to be on the front line of. I got to enjoy it. Now as our business has grown, started to get the contracts we really wanted, work with groups like Chick-fil-A or the Braves, the Ravens. We started to get everything we wanted, and then we got to bring on top talent. So now we have an amazing team, and they get to come help us, and we're impacting more people and more numbers. Our revenue is increasing, our culture, all those things. But now, instead of me doing the things I want to do, I'm sitting there dealing with an HR issue. I'm trying to figure out how to use the new software we're having to use, the new CRM, and I freaking hate it. I got to figure out how we're going to do payroll that month. All these kind of things that I did not enjoy, and every time I look at it, all it looks like to me is crap. And I really started to say, maybe I, maybe I didn't want to do this business because now all the things that I'm doing, I don't enjoy. And yeah, you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, just do what you want. That's not how business works. Somebody tells you, oh, just find what you want to do and just only do that. Yeah, that's nice, maybe one day down the road, but most of us are not going to deal with that every single day. But this is where it comes back to perspective. If every time I've got to grab a shovel and deal with some crap, and I only look at the crap, I'm going to have a pretty bad attitude about my work. I'm going to have a pretty negative view of what we're doing, and I am going to be toxic to the organization that I'm in. But every time that I scoop the shovel and deal with the crap, I say, man, I'm so glad I get to do this because look at the progress that's happening. Yeah, I've got to figure out the new technology that they're rolling out in my company, but that means our company is growing, it's not dying. Yes, I've got to figure out how to onboard somebody else who's a pain in the butt and they're distracting me from what I'm doing, but that means our company is growing. Yeah, I've got to figure out how we totally pivot our business model because of what happened with COVID. But you know what? Pivoting our business model means we're still in business and we still have an opportunity to do something. So every time I'm dealing with crap, if I view it as a side effect of progress, the way I view things will change how I do things and the way I do things changes the results I get. How many of you have something in your business right now, you have progress, but you're viewing it in the wrong way? And I'll tell you, Yes, there's some very strategic things you can do. Chad's going to talk about how do you make your business more profitable. Yes, you can add to your bottom line. Yeah, you can work on your purpose. Yes, you can prioritize differently. Yes, you can onboard and train differently. But until you have your perspective right, you'll never have the business that you really want to have. You've got to change your perspective. Here's one other thing I learned about that crap. Now, again, I didn't grow up on a farm, but I learned this. That that crap in one season, they use that for fertilizer in the next season. So the crap in one season becomes a catalyst for growth in another season. How many of you look back on something in your life that was miserable, that was painful, that was terrible, but without it, you would not be who you are today? How many of you be honest enough to say that? So here's my challenge to you today as you think about having a stronger business. As you think about your role, yes, you've got to change your perspective on purpose. You've got to make sure that it's clear so the mundane becomes meaningful. Yes, you've got to prioritize your priorities. Maybe the one thing you need to do 
if you get nothing else out of this conference, is you need to walk out and say, I've got all of these priorities. I need to put them in the right order, not only for me, but for the people who work with me so it's clear. Maybe you need to go see somebody differently. The way you see people is the way you treat them. But just maybe the one thing you need to do is walk out with a refreshed perspective on the progress you're making. And if you'll do that, if you'll change that perspective, you can change the interactions with the people around you. You'll change the way you show up at home after work. And you'll change the trajectory of your business. Because the way we view things really does change how we do things. I hope before you leave here today, you have a new perspective, you rush out and you apply it so that your business can go to a whole new level. I can't wait to hear what you guys learn today, how you apply it, and how your businesses thrive at a whole other level. I want to turn the stage back over. Would you guys give a huge welcome back to Josh Melton?